Just by opening this bag of seed, the stuff plants grow from, I'm entering a restrictive contract that could get me sued for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Except not really, because this isn't a real bag of seed, and the reason I couldn't get one is part of the story. But uh, let's take this outside. Up until 100 years ago, the American government used to give out seed for free leading to a collaborative system of agricultural research where everyone was working together to grow the best stuff. But then a secret society formed with the explicit goal of destroying the free seed program. That was the beginning of a series of events that led to today, where just four companies, two of which have a dark history, like the darkest history you can think of, control our food supply, down to literally a molecular level. That secret society is no longer a secret. They have conventions at Disneyland, and they're just a small part of what I'll call the life cartel. Wealthy industry leaders determined to privatize and put a price on everything. Digging into it all just raised more questions for me. Why does America only use 2% of our farmland for fruits and vegetables? And why do American farmers pay more for seed than most of the world while sharing less? We're gonna go into how exactly corporate power has killed millennia of agricultural norms that were beneficial to all in just a few decades, seized legal ownership of actual nature, and what it all means for you. You're watching The Classroom from More Perfect Union. And this is the first video in a series where we will track how corporate greed has made America's food economy worse at pretty much every level. Agricultural innovation used to be considered a communal good, something American farmers could work on together. A big part of that was free seed programs run by Congress, the Postal Service, and importantly, the US Patent Office. Patents were established in the Constitution, designed to motivate innovation and protect inventors with exclusive rights to their discoveries for a limited amount of time. The system was meant to encourage scientific advancement that would help everyone. In 1839, patent commissioner Henry Ellsworth started a program to collect seeds of new plants from around the world. It was even mandatory for government officials visiting other countries to collect seeds in their travels. The patent office's main goal here was innovation through the experimentation farmers naturally did as they did their jobs. In 1862, the USDA was created and given the power to procure, propagate, and distribute among the people new and valuable seeds and plants. Farmers and gardeners nationwide would get free seed, grow crops, take the seed from those crops, grow more crops, and eventually breed produce varieties best suited for their specific climate and soil. The farmers could profit from the fruits of their labor and uh, the vegetables of their labor too, but no one owned the rights to the greater species of that plant, the genetics themselves, because that would be crazy, right? When some guy tried to patent the fibers of a pine tree, Ellsworth declared it would be unreasonable and impossible to allow patents upon the trees of the forest and the plants of the earth. By the turn of the century, the USDA had given out almost a billion packets of seeds, asking farmers to report back on their findings to optimize growing. But all of that, all that great stuff I told you about? Free seed, communal research for the benefit of everyone, centuries old understandings of how agriculture worked, was about to be foiled as the machinations of profit worked in the background. In 1883, a group of seedsmen, that's really what seed business guys call themselves, sent out a letter to their industry fellows to convene in New York City for the first meeting of the American Seed Trade Association, one of the first trade organizations in America. That's the secret society we told you about earlier. They started meeting every year. After the 1885 meeting, a Topeka, Kansas newspaper wrote, We are in receipt of a printed circular purporting to give extracts from minutes of a meeting of the American Seed Trade Association. The object of the discussion was to evolve some plan whereby the government could be stopped from sending out free seeds. And free seed was constantly a big debate in Congress. In 1922, the debate came to a head. Clarence Linz, the Washington, D.C. correspondent for, uh, Seed World magazine reported an ASTA rep saying, the men in Congress will give free seeds such a death blow this year that this political graft will never be revived. They were right. The free seed program was discontinued in 1923 after intense lobbying from the industry. The seedsmen won. But ASTA had another free seed problem. Farmers were growing seeds that they paid for, then using the seeds of the offspring to continue growing produce. For free. <laughs> 
One big step in the corporate seizure of natural things involved these. In the 1800s, the biggest owners of nurseries and orchards were the Stark brothers. They told these annual fairs where farmers could bring new fruits they developed to sell the seeds to the Starks. At the 1892 fair, one farmer brought an apple variety that led magnate Clarence Stark to exclaim, Delicious! That will be its name. Stark thought his genius name meant he should own the apple, so he, quote, tracked down the source of the apple, bought sole rights to the tree, which he surrounded with a tall metal fence, and trademarked the fruit as the Stark Delicious, which eventually became the Red Delicious. But all Stark had really done was trademark the name, which, like, Red Delicious? Really, buddy? That's uh, stretching the bounds of intellectual property there, but it was still impossible to patent an actual living thing. In 1930, Paul Stark, yes, of the Stark Brothers, then the largest orchardist and breeder in America, allied with the American Association of Nurserymen, a breeder trade association similar to AASTA, to lobby Congress for a change in patent law. They had an ally, a senator named John Townsend. Townsend owned hundreds of thousands of acres of apple orchards, making him the second largest orchardist in the country after his friends, the Starks. Paul Stark literally wrote the bill, and the industry endorsed it. Everyone, from the International Apple Ship Association to the Peony and Iris Association. I'm not going to look up how to pronounce Peony. But the bill wasn't everything ASTA wanted. It only applied to plants that reproduced asexually. Most important crop vegetation reproduces sexually, which means seeds and pollination, like corn and soybeans. The industry and ASTA wanted more protection of their profits. But the next intellectual property bill wouldn't come up for another few decades. So we have time for a Great Depression fun fact. During the Great Depression, the Red Cross started giving out free seed again, and the American Seed Trade Association freaked the fuck out. They established the, quote, Committee on Free Seed Distribution, which determined that the Red Cross's behavior would, quote, result in an entirely new type of seed growing, one definitely for relief purposes. And get this, not for commercial purposes. But back to patents. In 1970, the 3,000th plant patent was given out for a nectarine tree with better eating quality. 3,000 patents in 40 years doesn't sound like a lot, but the floodgates were about to open. ASTA had cemented themselves as a powerful Washington lobbying group, and a new bill, the Plant Variety Protection Act, was written and, quote, introduced at the request of the American Seed Trade Association. It created a type of certification, a uh, quote, near patent, for sexually reproducing plants, which meant nearly any plant that a human had changed in any way through science or traditional breeding was ownable. It didn't apply to every plant because big soup, seriously, it was Campbell's and the canned veggie industry, convinced Congress to not allow the patenting of common soup vegetables like okra, celery, and carrots. You can't bake big soup. And it wasn't fully a patent either. Congress made sure these certificates would still allow for seed sharing, reuse, and research. Either way, the seedsmen were happy. John T. Sutherland, executive vice president of the American Seed Trade Association, calls it a major contribution to agriculture because of its simulation of research and reproduction from seed. In the late 70s, General Electric scientist Ananda Chakrabarty bred a microbe with a special ability. It could eat and digest oil. Miraculous for oil spells, which, side note, what the hell happened to that? That seems useful. But anyway, GE didn't want to share this technology with the world. What good is cleaning up oil spills if they couldn't make a profit off of it? So they attempted to patent it, a microbe. Their battle went all the way to the Supreme Court. In 1980s, Diamond versus Chakrabarty. Because Chakrabarty had created a living thing that didn't exist before, it was considered an invention. The Supreme Court ruled in favor of Chakrabarty and General Electric 5 to 4. That enabled the Patent Office to bring forward a case a few years later, which made it official. Novel, sexually reproducing organisms could be patented. Living things were now completely acceptable as intellectual property. The life cartel moved fast to exploit the new system and changed the landscape of how we eat what we eat incredibly quickly. In the 60s and 70s, before Chakrabarty, over 70% of soybeans harvested came from varieties developed by public funding, open to all. By the 90s, less than 10% was public, the rest fully privatized. 
That privatization is dominated by just four companies. Bayer, a pharmaceutical company, Syngenta, a division of a Chinese chemical company, BASF, a German chemical company, and Corteva, a spin-off of Dow, a chemical company. Yes, it's weird that it's chemical and pharmaceutical companies who own all the seeds. We'll get to that. But I wonder what these companies were doing while the seed companies fought for patent rights in the 1930s and on. Remember earlier when I was like, the darkest history you can think of? Uh, let's see here. Bayer and BASF history. Oh, they were a part of IG Farben, the German company that made Zyklon B. That's the chemical used in gas chambers during the Holocaust. Anyway, 75 years later, these companies are part of the life cartel. They've been consolidating our entire food supply. Take a look at this chart. It shows how much intellectual property they've gobbled up in the corn industry alone. Okay, so you just stuck with me for a hundred years of legislative history about plants. What does all of this really mean, both for hardworking American farmers and the over 99% of Americans who need food to live? It's a few things. Corporate abuse of farmers, a change in what and how we eat, and a, possibly the end of the world. Not only do US farmers pay way more for seed than the rest of the world, just by opening a bag of seed, farmers are signing long terms of service agreements, like the ones we all sign every time we download an app. But these are far more restrictive. In 1999, Indiana farmer Vernon Bowman bought Monsanto soybean seed. Monsanto's usually the poster child of all this, but they were absorbed by Bayer in 2016. Bowman signed Monsanto's usual contract, giving away his rights to growing second-generation crops from the Monsanto seeds. Seven years later, he was investigated by Monsanto, who found his crops contained their genetics. So they sued him. It went all the way to the Supreme Court, which ruled in favor of Monsanto. The ruling was unanimous. Yeah, that includes RBG. Justice Kagan's opinion stated that you cannot copy a patented product, even if that product naturally copies itself by the very basics of how life works. It affects small seed growers too. If they want to license a genetic trait, not even a full seed, just a specific trait, they often have to hand over their own business information, like customer lists, to their much larger competitor. Why do the small companies need the big companies' genetic traits? Because many of the traits exist to make plants safe from the pesticides the chemical conglomerates that own the seed IP make. One of the most successful seed traits of all time is Roundup Ready, trademark. Trademarked by Monsanto, now owned by Bayer. This ad is Australian, but it gets the point across. To enable you to see the benefits of the Roundup Ready technologies and plant in 2022, you'll need to sign a new license and stewardship agreement. Roundup Ready, trademark's only benefit is that it protects plants from Roundup, a pesticide made by Monsanto. The proliferation of Roundup means every seed company needs to incorporate Roundup Ready, trademark, traits into their seed. They're creating the problem to profit off of the solution. But all of this intellectual property protection must be great for innovation, right? Leading us into an amazing technological food future. Nope, it means fewer choices for consumers. Since 1970, the year of the Plant Variety Protection Act, the percentage of American diets that comes from corn and canola, the crops the seed industry makes the most money off of, have skyrocketed. They changed the way we eat and what we eat to retain ownership and increase profits. All of the innovation promised by the death of free seeds and rise of owned seeds has done nothing for average people and a lot for the life cartel. And sorry, yeah, I, I dropped the end of the world a little bit earlier and it took me a few minutes to get here, but a rise in growing only the most profitable crops created monoculture. That's where a single crop takes over a given area around the world. That means lack of biological diversity, which degrades soil, harms essential pollinators, and generally alters the earth in a way it's not meant to be altered. Generations of farmers had rotated crops in a much more sustainable way. The life cartel got rid of all of that. But if our earth continues on its path to complete uninhabitability, the life cartel will be just fine. They are developing new seeds focusing on climate readiness, seeds with traits for survival in a rapidly changing world. In 2010, there were 1,600 patent documents for climate genes. Two thirds were owned by the life cartel. If we reach a world where only those plants can survive, then the domination of our food system will be pretty much complete. So uh, what can we do about this? Well, let's think back. Who was in charge of the seed and patent system when it worked? That's right, the USDA. 
I'm assuming you said that, like Blue's Clues or something. Of course, this important government agency isn't immune to corporate capture. That's when business interests take control of regulatory groups. But after this declaration by President Biden, Big Ag is putting a squeeze on farmers. They're seeing price hikes for seed, lopsided uh, con contracts, shrinking profits, and growing debt. The USDA put together a team to examine the effects of consolidation and intellectual property on our food system. Part of their solution is a return to history. Collaboration between the USDA and the Patent Office for transparency in agricultural patents and more freedom for researchers and breeders. They also recommended working with the Department of Justice and Federal Trade Commission to go after anti-competitive practices, aka monopoly practices, in the seed industry. But remember, all that might sound great, but they're just recommendations. The USDA and the Biden administration need to fulfill them to take on big seed. And they need to go even further to create a communal research system that works to benefit farmers and eaters instead of executives and shareholders. This is just the first video in a series about the way corporate greed makes things worse for everyone who eats food. So support our work and please don't forget to like and subscribe.